Well, good morning, folks. It's um, wanted to get y'all's work day started because I know everybody's got at least four or five committees they're going to go to today. Um, I hope. Um, we. Oh, goodness. Y'all would be surprised that, so, that some of the emails and text messages we get while we're sitting up here. Um, no, they're, they're not getting personal. Um, they're, they're, you've heard of the ter term begging and groveling and this kind of stuff. Um, Okay, but Miss Lewis, would you ask um, Senator Mullis to come in, please? Yes, ma'am, Senator Mullis. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm so Good morning, glad to be sir. Here. I like to be. I like to work with my my fellow rules chairman. So I know you got to go get back to work. Indeed. Because you're gonna be getting house bills out, right? I certainly. That is my plan. Okay. Okay. But sometimes there are other voices uh, higher than me that has other plans. And thank you, Mr. Leader, for working things out. I'm grateful. But I'll get on with it, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for having me this morning. Uh, Senate Bill 255. And first off, I don't know what happened to me this year. I have too many bills. I don't know. I kept saying yes. Oh, we've been yes. thinking about that, too. Yeah, I agree. I kept saying yes, yes, yes. But this is the border bill, and I'll, I'll give you a quick explanation. I, my district touches Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I hate that orange color up here, there in Tennessee. But they have a border bill that they have taken business that I was going to recruit and put in Chattanooga, and that's just not right. Now, so this will help every uh, county around the border, perhaps. And I will tell you, some people have asked me, well, where did 10 miles come from? Yeah, that's well, what I want to know, too. I pulled it out of my, I okay. pulled it out of, I pulled it out of there. I I and uh, I'm, I'm good with, uh, with um, changing that. Whatever the wisdom of uh, the House wants to do is fine with me. Well, you know, I've, I've heard such things as, you know, making it for counties that are contiguous to sure. the state. But then if you look at some counties, and, I, and I'm not picking on Ware County, but, you know, if you do that with Ware County, you go 70 miles up into the yeah. into the state. It's the largest county in Georgia. Um, well, so Great County's on that western border is what I'm concerned about, yeah. to make sure they're taken care of. Okay. And whatever you think is best, I'm agreeable. To. All right. Well, I got uh, Representative Williamson that's got a question for you. Uh-oh. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chairman Muller, serious question. You said that legislation is in effect in Tennessee. They have a border bill. Uh, what's their mileage? That's my question. Mm -hmm. I don't really know their mileage, to be honest with you. I think it's the contiguous counties. Mm -hmm. But East Ridge, which is a suburb of Chattanooga, they, they got uh, Bass Pro Shop and uh, Top Golf and several uh, big restaurants and other big retail. And I'd rather not go out behind a building and whoop their fanny. I'd rather you help me here and uh, help all of our counties on the border. Okay. Chairman Hatchett. Senator Mullis, I just was curious as to when your luxurious committee would be meeting again so our House members could hopefully get some of their bills out oh, and, and, and on me, the floor. Let me tell you, I'm advocating as well, and I think that it's just, I'm, if when I leave here, I'm going to that office, and I will text you when that will happen. How's that? You think there will be one today? Uh, yes. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Chairman Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to thank the gentleman. I have three little counties on the border with Florida and Alabama. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chairman Hawkins. I appreciate you bringing the bill. I just wondered how, you know, you got this 10 mile. Would you pucker up for five? Pucker up. <laughs> I think a little further would be better. Further? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, to, to make sure we get places like uh, Callaway Gardens or other okay. important uh, factors on our bordering counties. We, well, we just won't be able to get Lake Lanier a little too far <laughs> in. <laughs> Anything contiguous then, right? Well, whatever this committee All right. wants is okay. good with me. All right. And, and of course, there is a border, I mean, the uh, Tourism Investment Act, which covers the entire state. And I would recommend if you've got a tourism kind of applicant, I would push them that direction. Okay. No more questions. Thank you, sir. I'm honored. Let me and, know what I can do for this. And let us know when we go. We can go to rules in the Senate. Yes, sir. I will. Thank All you, right. sir. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, you too. Mr. Harper. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Good to be with you again. Um, you want me to... You have Senate Bill 198 and Senate Bill 213. Yes, sir. Uh, Senate Bill 198 is a bill that um, in the code currently there uh, is a listed amount of hours and an amount of money that the General Assembly, if, if appropriated, would be given to members of the Department of Public Safety as an incentive pay. What this does is it m moves that code section and another code section deletes the hour requirement, deletes the amount of money, and gives a, and if we so to choose to appropriate any funds, it gives the commissioner the authority to make that, uh, that incentive pay for educational uh, purposes available to the members of the Department of Public Safety. That's Senate Bill 198, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we have a question in the back. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, appreciate yes, sir. you bringing this bill. I just had one question, uh, and we certainly want to support our Department of Public Safety. But I was just wondering why nothing passed that thought about legislators here in the Capitol. <laughs> nothing came from the Senate on that issue except no, no, no. Just wondering. I, I, I understand, Representative Williams, that is, that is true there. We haven't. Uh, uh, passed anything addressing those of us that serve under this building, but, but uh, we have passed a few things to, to take care of the folks that work for the state of Georgia and ensuring that they're uh, taken care of and seen after, and we want to make sure that that continues to be the case, but uh, if you uh, if all pass anything over to us in the Senate regarding the legislature, I'm sure we'll give it the highest consideration to my good friend. I'm sure you will, my friend. Yeah, it was going to be. You were going to play mm -hmm. one? Okay, Chairman Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. To my esteemed counterpart over in the Senate, um, my bill that uh, what's Vance Smith's bill is still nesting in your committee, and we're hoping that there's some way it can move it past the House with only two dissenting votes. So, thank you for your consideration. Uh, Madam Chairman, I suspended my committee meeting to be here at 9 o'clock, and that bill will be taken up as soon as I leave this particular uh, House committee. And, you know, that's the kind of thing I like to see the Senate do. You know, they, they hold off their meeting so they can come talk to us. I did, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate that. Chairman Fleming. Mr. Chairman, I have a question about one of the Senator's bills that you didn't mention, but I don't want to waste committee's time. It's how, Senate Bill 260. Should I ask it now or not? Uh, let, let's wait till he comes and presents 260. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so you had Senate Bill 213? Yes, now? sir. Senate okay. Bill 213 is a bill. Uh, that kind of arose out of an issue with one of my local school systems dealing with energy savings contracts as a way to finance capital projects. There's some, uh, uh, there's really some, not, it's not real clear in the law whether or not local school systems can use uh, East Floss dollars for that purpose. This clarifies the law to allow them to do that and uh, address that issue uh, and, and help our local school systems across the state. That's what Senate Bill 213 does, okay. Mr. Chairman. Be happy to answer any questions. Okay, I see no questions. Before you leave. Yes, sir. Um, in, re in regard to Chairman Fleming's uh, question, um, I guess it's Senate Bill 260. Could yes, you sir. present 260? I can, yes, sir, and I appreciate you giving me that opportunity to do Senate Bill 260. As you know, Senate Bill 260 was sent back to Ag Committee. 
uh, by this committee, that, and we made a, a change, and in, in, in the House Ag Committee made a change and in, in, in a substitute, which is uh, now back before you in the Rules Committee, and that change was it would require the uh, owner or operator of a farm to have a nutrient management plan in place in regards to soil amendments. Uh, and I can dive off into all the details of what that entails, but we believe that this put that by, by doing this, this will address a lot of the issues that have been brought forward over the last week or two in regard to the underlying bill. Uh, it still has the other language in regards to uh, the buffers and the forest products and the byproducts, et cetera. Uh, but by adding that nutrient management plan, I think it addressed a lot of the questions in that regard, and that's the, that was the change we made and, or that was made by the House Ag Committee. Well, you know, most of the larger um, commercial farms and even private farms that are um, very successful ha all have a nutrient management plan. That's correct. All right. Chairman Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, um, my question goes to line 28 and 29 of the bill on page 2. <clears throat> and, uh, and please correct me if I'm mistaken, but we have passed legislation through the House and Senate before dealing with this issue of byproducts like chicken uh, leftovers that are used litter. For, for litter that is well and, and other processing stuff that's left over used for fertilizer. And the problem we've tried to address is that people are spreading this not just as fertilizer, unfortunately, but sometimes as um, a way to get rid of it and calling it fertilizer because they can do it that way. And I know we're trying to address all those problems. But my question is about line 28 and 29. We had allowed our local governments to have setbacks so that my house can be a little bit further away from where they're doing this spreading because it kicks up quite a smell. And you're limiting on line 29 the ability for the setback to be only 100 feet. And if I was only 100 feet away from this, I would be greatly concerned. And I'm just wondering, what is the rationale from doing that rather than letting the locals decide how far away you need to be from it? So, Representative Fleming, to your question, uh, I don't have the bill in front of me, but I know exactly what you're talking about in regards to the buffer. Uh, this was a discussion that came out last year when we were working on House Bill 1057, which was the original bill that we uh, passed. Um, we actually worked on some buffer language in the Senate. The fear was that we didn't have enough time before Sine died to get the bill across the finish line. There was an agreement made that we will work on the buffer language this year, and that's why we're here back with this particular bill that's in front of you. If you look at Georgia code and, and, and look through Georgia code and where we address issues like this when we're dealing with buffers, uh, the, law, the, the most extensive buffer under Georgia law is 100 feet. There's 25, 50, and 100 feet buffers under Georgia law. Uh, and nowhere else in Georgia law do we have unlimited buffers. Uh, the, the issue under, un, in this is that we're giving local governments unparalleled authority that we've never gave them before, especially when it comes to agricultural products related to this particular issue. Uh, if all 159 counties adopted uh, certain buffers, you could exempt out the entire state of Georgia. And obviously, uh, that was not the impetus or the, the plan behind House Bill 1057. So uh, 100 foot was the agreed upon language by a lot of the parties that were involved. Uh, and we felt that that's just in conformity with what current state law says in regards to buffers. Uh, and uh, anything, when you really get into buffers and you start talking about buffers, and I can talk about this a long time and I'm not, but you're really talking about taking somebody's private property. Uh, and where we have 100 foot buffers under state law, most of that is on state owned property anyway uh, in, in Georgia. Uh, most of the private property has 25 or 50 foot buffers. There really aren't any uh, 100 foot buffers on, on, on a lot of private property across our state. So this is even new uh, in the Georgia code when we're putting a 100 foot buffer. I think the 100 foot buffer is fair and with the nutrient management plan, uh, put it in, it in place, and, if, and, and when the folks are doing it like they're supposed to, you won't have the issues uh, like, you're, like you're addressing because soil amendments are actually uh, put under the ground. Uh, they're injected into the ground, and it's actually beneficial uh, to the farmer and the producer. In some cases, saves a lot of our farmers 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars a year in fertilizer cost. Uh, so there's a benefit to this, and we have to weigh all the options in this regard. I think 100 foot is fair, but uh, I appreciate your insight on that. 
Well, you mentioned taking folks' as property, and I wouldn't put it that way, but since you said that, we've already decided we're going to do that by 100 feet. You and I are just talking about by how much now, right? <laughs> And I'd love well, to see I, I, would ar I would argue, Mr. Chairman, that 100 foot has stood the test of time in Georgia law, and 100 foot has been found to be fair, apparently, under Georgia law. Uh, I think you go any further than that, you really do get into the conversation of taking. Uh, and, um, and, I, and I don't know that we really want to go down that road. Well, just one last question. Yes, sir. Before you added that lines I'm talking about, uh, did we have any issues of taking? Yes. There are some buffers that are, uh, I think Chairman Jasper said it uh, as eloquently as I could have. Uh, there, 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 there is a, there is a uh, I, I, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about this offline, uh, Representative Thank Fleming. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. If you would like to do that. All right, Whip Kelly. Thank you. Okay, try it now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I share some of these same concerns. I'm dealing with this issue in my district right now, and my concern and, and, and understanding of, of traditional buffers is we're dealing with something that can be different here in terms of smell and odor. And uh, I, I've gotten a report recently that, that uh, a member of my community is doing this, and they meet all the requirements under law, but I'm still getting a lot of concern and pushback from members of that community about the smell and the odor. And so I guess my question would be, one, I, I don't share the takings uh, concern because uh, when, when we, we to, to have an invalid takings, it means you completely reduce the ability to use that land for uh, for value, and we wouldn't be doing that by increasing the buffer. So my question would be, would you be open uh, to a uh, an amendment that would extend this buffer further? Uh, well, I, I, I have not seen your proposed amendment without. I don't have one your, yet. I'm just asking you. I, if just to be honest, no. Okay, I was just trying to see if I could vote for it or not. Thank you. It depends on it depends on what the amendment would be uh, to the whip. Thank you, Chairman Jaspers. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, isn't it true that um, the buffers generally that we're talking about are directly related to protecting water resources? Yes. And that's been our focus with buffers continually is protecting the state waters and the use of waters and communities and, and that the nutrient management plan that you described has been a key asset yes. to farmers and communities to protect water resources. And I that's think correct. that's the, the nice addition to your bill was to do that. And I think bringing smell and other things into this are not relevant to what you're talking about in this bill. Is that no, true? That would be accurate. Thank you. Chair Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm not tacking on. But oh, excuse you, me, what's the matter with your voice? I think I need something stronger to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn the volume up. <laughs> <clears throat> so to add to these layers of buffer discussion, one of the things about private property rights is that our local governments are still valuing property even though this property owner has limited use of the property so the buffer argument keeps going on there are citizens who demand buffers to our quarry mining there are citizens who demand buffers for all these different things so i know this is an active discussion but one of our biggest problems is local government and they are still taxing property at full value when there is a takings already of their property so um i don't have the answer to this problem but um, I just know when chitlins are being made when I go to North Augusta, so. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, who said, uh, Chairman Knight? Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Harper, I, I, I guess a question, and, and it's been brought up in regards to smell and I, I guess complaints from um, neighboring property owners, but in past experience in regarding agriculture, I've, I have a, a personal experience with a, a, a family friend who's a farmer in which the uh, development had encroached upon farmland and all of a sudden, you know, the farmer had been there farming for years, but all of a sudden the, the neighbors are complaining to the local government about smells, whether that be in regards to um, fertilizer or other issues, 
what protects the farmer who's been there for perhaps decades from the encroachment of development? Is, is that what this is intended to do? Representative Knight, to your, to your question, and I appreciate it, I would argue that that, that, is, uh, that is one of the underlying intents of this bill is to protect the, the, the number one industry in our state, the, num you know, the producers and the farmers and ranchers in our state. Uh, I think that's the purpose of, of this General Assembly, to ensure that we have fair and equitable laws that apply across the board to allow individuals to, to practice and, and, and to, to be able to exercise uh, their rights and their operate their operations and their farming operations. And um, I believe that this is a fair uh, measure that, it, that addresses that. Uh, and I believe that uh, the way that this is outlined, that, um, that we've, we've put some, some additional language in there that, that come back from the House, House Ag Committee that helps address a lot of the concerns that have been brought up this morning. Uh, and and the, the problem is, is there have been a lot of bad actors. I'm not, I'm not going to uh, dismiss that. And those bad actors have, have, have been the impetus of a lot of the problems where, and the reason for 1057 uh, last year. Uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of those bad actors have been the subject of EPD sanctions and, and, and sanctions from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and, and that's where we should be. I know in the budget, the House passed, uh, we put some additional language in there for a soil scientist and an agronomist uh, and an enforcement officer in the budget. Uh, and, and we need to make sure that that gets across the finish line because that's going to give the Department of Agriculture the tools it needs to implement 1057 and 260 if we're able to get 260 across the finish line. Uh, and, and I think what we're going to see is, is over time this will be addressed uh, and we will be able to get it addressed. Uh, and I, I, I think that uh, moving this forward would be the right thing to do. Uh, and, and back to, to Whip Kelly's uh, question uh, to the Whip, if you have an amendment, I'd be happy to look at it and give you my opinion on it. Uh, but without seeing your amendment, I would not be in favor of it un unless I, I saw it. But obviously that's up to this Rules Committee to decide what it does. Uh, and, uh, and I look forward to, to working with you all on that moving forward and like to see this bill uh, move forward, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Okay. In regard to Chairman Knight's comments, those kind of things do happen. You don't want to build a house downwind of a uh, hog farm. Mm -hmm. They do it, and then they complain. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, unfortunately, uh, sometimes the, the farmer loses, even though they've done everything right. Um, it's just one of those things, unfortunately. All uh, right, Chairman Martin. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, we, we don't do much farming anymore up in North Fulton, but I did want to make sure I understood. Your additions on line 20, I know you don't have the bill, but. The, hey, the, uh, Chairman, could you take yes, your mask? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you don't have the bill, but what you're doing is you're adding additional things that are excluding for, excluded from the regulation. That's right? the, the, yeah, the, the byproducts language. Right. That's so you're, I, I was just looking at, normally if you're adding some more exclusions, you'd, you'd be concerned about perhaps increasing a buffer. And, and that, that's just what bothers me is you're, you're adding some more things that are excluded and, and then you're also limiting the buffer. So I, I believe that's what the, the whip is, so I, is I would looking to, to talk to you about. To, to your point. Um, on the, the exclusions that are added. That was an oversight last year. That was supposed to be in the original language. Uh, we, we did not address that. Forest products were completely supposed to be exempt, and that takes care of the rest of the forest products that were supposed to be exempt. Uh, and that was an oversight in 1057 last year to Chairman Martin. Okay. Very good. Thank you, sir. No more Thank questions. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Appreciate bring in it. Representative LaHood. House Resolution 406. House Resolution 406. Morning, sir. Good morning. And thank you for hearing my bill, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is House Resolution 406, and it's just a, it's an urging resolution, and it's urging the uh, Georgia Emergency Operations Plan to prioritize um, more of the long-term care service support uh, network in its, um, in its planning for emergencies. And I can go in more detail if you'd like me to. Well, I don't see any questions. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. All right, Senator Burke, he has really generated a lot of phone calls. 
the last phone call we got before we walked out of the office was in regard to his his bill here, 40, Senate Bill 46. I got a question I want to ask you before you get started. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. There was a question, and every call we've been getting relates to sharing of health data with a third party. Has that been answered? Uh, your whip helped us with that, Mr. Chairman. Came up with some language I was happy with. Okay, well, go ahead and tell us what it is. Um, or go ahead, just do the bill. I just want to be sure that's been answered, but go ahead and do your bill. Yeah. Well, Senate Bill 46 is a, a Department of Public Health Agency bill that uh, modernizes the, the vaccine code and puts into code some of the uh, improvements that have been made during this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, the section that's been giving people heartburn is Section 3, and in <coughs> between lines 58 and uh, 62, the, we use the language the whip suggested to try to ameliorate everyone's concerns. So it's only available for the CDC? That's correct, sir. Okay. All right. Chair what Lady Cooper. Uh, I think if you look on lines uh, 68 of the, um, let's see, it starts at 68. Wait a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, individual identifiable. Sure, Ms. Coop. Okay, thank you. Uh, individual identifiable vac uh, vaccination registry information shall be treated as confidential and shall not be released to a third party without consent of the persons or the person's parents, guardian of the person is 18 years of age or younger. What they're telling me at the department that that is the exception and it's an exception for all vaccines. Okay. Well, I, I see no more questions. Thank you, sir. Hold Thank on, hold on, hold on. Chairman Jaspers. I'm sorry, Chairman Burke, my friend. I, I think people that have contacted me and everyone in this room is, a, is line 51 and 52. And is there a way that this can be written without that? Because they see it as a direct, uh, just taking away of someone's private knowledge because it says without the consent of a person or person's parents or guardians. And um, I know it can say all sorts of other things throughout the bill that, that kick that back to as they're not doing it, but you know, our constituents and the people um, that are concerned about privacy really are on fire about that, those two lines. I, I'm just not sure how we can get the information that CDC requires without that line. I, I just, I've not seen them another mechanism and we're getting that vaccine from the federal government for nothing and and those people that are that upset about that particular issue have the choice to to not get the vaccine uh, so it's not like we're mandating anything they they don't have to provide their information because they don't have to get the vaccine uh, Shirley Cooper okay unfortunately there was a scribbler error a scribblers error, error. That is not new, but the reason that it's underlined is because the, the, whoever did this bill moved it down to line 63, and you notice it's marked through there, and it was put back where it was originally in, in the law. But section two says you can take the vaccine and you don't have to let them have your information. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that that is for all vaccines, and that's correct. I'll verify it, but they have the right to opt out of giving their information on all vaccines. Okay. Okay. Chairman Knight. Or is it Chairman Martin? Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. I, I believe in the previous iteration of this bill, I, I brought up the concern that a, a doctor, a constituent of mine, ha had, had brought in and of the whip worked with the doctor on the language. And I would agree with Madam uh, Chair Cooper that the, the information on line 63 before 60, 58 and 62 were in, injected in the bill is not true that these normal processes were already in Georgia law. It's just we're seeing that uh, without the consent of a person in front of paragraph A and B now, whereas prior to it was in the law 
having the same operational impact after. Is that not true, that, Doctor? That's true, and that was a decision by Legislative Council because they felt like it made more sense to, to change y it. Yes, sir. So, it, so relative to the new things, the, that has been addressed. The new right. vaccine, the emergent uh, issue around the pandemic has been addressed, but A and B paragraphs exist if this bill passes as they do in current law now. Isn't that's that right. True? It doesn't change current law. Chair Lee Cooper, uh, but last, what, last comment. Okay, but having called several times about this, even on regular vaccines for children and all, if the parents don't want to put it or the person doesn't want it, they are telling me at public health that they are exempt and they don't have to give them their information. And I said, you mean, how are we gonna tell our schools that these kids have been vaccinated if they ask for it? And they said, well, if the parents don't want their information in there, they don't have to put it thanks to section uh, two. Okay. All right, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank y'all. Ms. Lewis, would you let Mr. Cantrell in, Representative Cantrell? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just here to present the uh, committee substitute for Senate Bill 100, which is uh, the equivalent to House Bill 44 that you guys passed out, which would take Georgia to permanent daylight saving time pending congressional approval. And that's the one to pass the House and to send the Senate. <coughs> and yes, they, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Anyone, any questions? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Senator DeGooch is next. Senate Bill 47. Senator DeGooch. Morning, Senator. Good morning. How are we doing? We're good. Good. Senate Bill 47 is a bipartisan bill that came out of your education committee this week that it opens up access to the Georgia uh, Special Needs Scholarship. Uh, currently under state law, it's the IEP uh, students that are designated with an IEP plan that can utilize these scholarships. There's roughly 54,000 students that have access to them. This bill expands that to allow students under a 504 plan with certain uh, diagnosis to also get utilization of that scholarship program. Any questions from anybody? All right. Oh, yeah. Which button are you pushing? I'll have to line them all up back thank, there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, quick question. Um, I've received some emails from parents who children already are on an IEP, receive the scholarship. Their concern is that this is going to vastly expand the program and cut into funding. Is there, have you heard those same concerns? I'm, I'm surprised that a parent of a child that utilizes this scholarship would say that because the parents that, that were in committee testified in favor of this because of the importance of what it's done for their child's education. So it will not cut into the funding on it because you're basically using the, the FTE funds that are allocated by the Department of Education and that's what the scholarship amount is. Whatever the, the individual students score is when they're categorized for their special needs services, that's how they come up with the, the funding and the quantification of that QBE formula. Okay, so one more question. So yes, this sir. would pull additional money from the public school system or is it? No, sir. It's, I say, so I live in Dahlonega, Lumpkin County. If I decide to take my child to Dawson County to live, mm -hmm. then the school in Lumpkin County would not get the QBE funding from the state in Lumpkin County, but it would go to the Dawson County School if that's where I take my child. So the same thing would apply here. If your child has a 504 diagnosis, then you would be able to take that child from that Lumpkin County School to another school that offers those services, and that QBE money would follow your child. I lied one more. Yes, sir. That's good. Yes, sir. So let me get this straight, but currently 504 students do not get the special needs scholarship, is that, that correct? That is correct. And this would then move it to not only other public schools, but private schools as well, right? There are roughly If there's one available in your county, because a, right. a lot of counties don't have there's, one. And there's not one in Lumpkin County, that's correct. Okay. Chairman Sessler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the author. I appreciate um, your, your sharing with, with the gentleman. Uh, isn't it true that um, if a family 
were to leave one county and go to another county because the the dollars follow them um, this has no impact whether family leaves the county moves to another county or leaves the county and goes to one of these these private entities isn't that correct that is correct so, so our local school system that, that's serving these kids also isn't it true that um, there are families that have to feel like they have to uh, move because their current circumstance is not serving their kid well this could allow families to not have to move to another county just to be served in a way that serves their kid isn't that true absolutely very so, true and, and one, one last question mr chairman isn't it true that uh, when um, because it's the only the, the state dollars that's following the kids the local dollars are left behind that is also correct and, and because of that i would just share with the uh, representative wilkerson when that happens uh, the state money leaves local money stays per pupil funding in, in the school district the student leaves goes up because the local money that's been funding that child stays behind and there's no kid to educate it anymore so this guarantees every kid that takes this program per pupil funding in that school district when they leave goes up to serve the other kids better thank you representative Sessor. whip kelly oh majority leader burns Mr. Chairman, does this um, also help um, our military folks to make sure that they're taken care of and, um, and certainly those children that may be uh, in the, um, that have been adopted or in the uh, process that make sure they're taken care of and extend some coverage to them that would be very, very beneficial? Yes, sir, it does, Mr. Leader. Thank you for asking that. Okay. No more questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. All right, we're going to skip. <clears throat> we've, we've got three bills that will be presented tomorrow that had been scheduled for today. Um, they're being held for uh, because that Judiciary Committee has about 12 or 15 bills that they're going to try to get out this morning that are House bills. So I'm going to call on uh, Senator Miller. Did I see Senator... Hey, Ms. Lewis, let Senator Watson come in, because he's on that Judiciary Committee. We want him to get back to work. Right yes, sir. This is Senate Bill 235. Right. So uh, this has to do with um, the emergency orders that Governor Kemp uh, made, because prior to his emergency orders to wear a mask in the state of Georgia was illegal. Uh, so this, after the emergency orders are over, this will allow people to wear masks under the direction of their health care provider uh, or to prevent illness. Uh, and that's basically all it does. Okay. Well, I'll see no questions. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Now, Senator Miller. Well, that's not Senator Miller. Senator Harbin, this is your first time here this year. It is, sir. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank well, you. you may say that now, but go ahead. <laughs> you have Senate Bill 156. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Senate Bill 156. Um, it is a bill that creates the Commissioner of Chief Labor, uh, dealing with the issues that we've had with the Labor Department and trying to provide help to them to get out reports and things of that nature. Uh, if you look at the bill, it is uh, the duty of that uh, person to provide timely reports and to respond to any financial audits of the department's request. This person will be appointed by the Speaker of the House and confirmed by the Senate Committee on Government Oversight. Um, the, uh, it will, he, will serve at, he or she will serve at the pleasure of the speaker and, and be removed by the speaker with a confirmation of the Senate Oversight Committee. The Commissioner of Labor shall provide the Chief Labor Officer with sufficient funds. Those have already been provided for. Uh, I confirm that with um, Senator Tillery. Uh, so the funds have already been uh, appropriated. As far as that, the Commissioner of Labor uh, will have access to the information and records uh, to be provided on a timely basis. This also has a sunset provision of December 31st, 2002 and it's to, to help get information out uh, that is needed uh, financially and the reports on a timely basis. Okay, Whip Kelly. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, as I read through the, the responsibilities of this new chief labor officer, it hits me that a lot of this probably could or should be being done by the uh, labor commissioner. Is, uh, it, would you agree with that assessment? And could you tell me if you feel like there has been a uh, dereliction of that duty to the point that we need to do this? From those who have uh, spoken with me, there needs to be a timeliness so that we do not have any risk of uh, our financial ratings and other things and that the reports be done timely. And with all that's gone on, the, um, with COVID and all the things that are there, this department has had an overload and what we're trying to do is help the workers and help the people that are there with additional help that this person would provide. Representative Hughley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the author of the bill. Um, would you speak a little bit about the coordination between this position and the Department of Labor Commissioner? What, who's on first, who's on second? Is one in charge of the other? Tell me more about that. As, as it's currently written, he run, run, runs independently, if you look, and also reports back to the Speaker and to the uh, Senate Committee on Oversight. Uh, from that standpoint, we were, what, what our thoughts were is that it would be someone who could assist and help in getting timely reports back to us from that posture. Okay, who's number 75? Chairman Knight. Thank you. Uh, to my, my friend and uh, my senator. Um, I, oh, I, bless your heart. <laughs> Uh, no, he's he's pretty good. He's pretty good. Yeah, okay. He's, he's, he's yeah, well, he and I worked a lot over the last few years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think as I read this, and especially I'm looking at line 42. I, again, I think what you're trying to do is to help the Department of Labor by adding some resources, especially during this time, because I see that there's a, a code section, basically a sunset, if I'm not mistaken, that would would sunset this unless it's. Uh, uh, reenacted uh, by the General Assembly in December of 22. Is that correct? That is correct. I think we, we're hoping we're out of this COVID thing before that time, and this is a temporary relief issue to provide additional help. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mr. Wilkerson, watch. Let me find your button here. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the author, I think we are all experiencing this where we submit a claim to the Department of Labor for a constituent, and then we call them and ask them for uh, you know, an update, and they tell us we can't by law. And one of the possible solutions is that something gets reported back to the House as far as status of claims. Will this help us at all with our constituents on their claim processing, or is this just more of a, an administrative function? The original one had a little more um, authority in it as far as that, and one of the things we've talked about is having the ability for our offices to be able to at least see status of what a claim is and where it is, because like everyone, it, that's coming in so fast, and, and these things do take time because of all the checks that have to be done uh, legally. But it would be our hope that this would relieve a little bit of pressure in other areas so that they can uh, concentrate on getting Georgians the money that's really belongs to them, that we need to get it out. So it, this is a hope that this help would help speed up that whole process. But, but is there a way that when Mrs. Jones calls me and asks me about her status that we could put in this bill that we would be able to get an update on, on a status on a particular person? Is there a way to, to add that to this bill? I would be open uh, to an amendment. If you can put an amendment together to help us, uh, I think that, that's another part that we, we serve those people because our, of the log jam that's there, to be very honest. And this is, a, I hate to say, once-in-a-lifetime experience, but we need to realize that there are people who are frustrated, uh, and, and I've had multiple calls just like I'm sure you have from your constituents. Okay. Thank you. I can Thank get that today. Sir. Appreciate it. Okay. Ms. Cooper, did you push the button behind you? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like. Okay, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To the author of the bill, I've heard and I've listened very closely, and I think everybody agrees we've got a mess now. But the problem is, we get this appointment. We're not good at getting rid of things when the problem goes away. After the pandemic, it's still going to be in place with the same cost. 
then how do we justify? Well, if you look at line 42 on December 31st, 22, this position goes away. There's a sunset provision on it. Oh, I'm sure looking forward to that sunset. It'll be an interesting day. I would, <laughs> would agree with you, sir. Okay. No more questions. Thank you, sir. Okay. No. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Have a good day. You too. Okay. Is Senator Miller here? He's not here. Okay. Um, Senator Payne here. Okay, I, I think I saw Senator Brass out there a while ago. Let, let, let's let him in then. Morning, sir. Morning, Mr. Chairman. You got Senate Bill 246. What does that do? Yes, sir. This is a, uh, in, in response to the pandemic, obviously the uh, restaurant industry was devastated and a little something to help them out, just allowing mixed drinks to go. Has to be in a sealed container. Uh, no straw hole will go either in a locked glove box or behind a third row or in a trunk, uh, very similar to the uh, Merlot to go language. Are you, are you, are you on 246? Wait, what? Cause that's, this is an, a learning pod protection. Oh yeah, yeah, that one, that one. We're not, we're not allowing kids to take drinks. Um, sorry about that. Got, got my numbers mixed up. <laughs> Those aren't two good ones to get mixed up. Okay, okay hold on, Whip Kelly. I just wanted, I just wanted to know uh, <laughs> how many of the senator of those to-go drinks has he had this morning? <laughs> Maybe I need a couple. Um, all right, sorry, let me pivot here. That's so, right, 246, the Learning Pod Protection Act. Well, again, we did learn some things from the pandemic. Um, when kids were for forced into uh, virtual school, and we're talking about public education kids, K through 12, they're forced into public school. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, forced into virtually learning, most of them at home. Uh, a lot of parents needed to get back to work. So what we saw in, uh, really in a, in a lot of our suburban and urban areas that we saw groups in, of families kind of grouping together and putting their kids in a home and, um, and so that they could all virtually learn together. You'd have maybe one parent stay with the kids while uh, the other, other parents went to work and then they'd kind of alternate and they became known as learning pods. So, uh, what this bill does is it simply says that the state or the local boards can't come in and start forcing these parents to get a license or anything like that. This, you know, we, we worked with DECAL on, on really di differentiating uh, the difference in a family child uh, daycare uh, home versus these. So we worked out that language. And um, so really it's just making sure that these learning pods don't, don't have any undue regulations on them. Okay, I don't see any questions. Oh, hold on. Chairman Knight. Thank you to my friend. Um, so j just, just to clarify, we had Georgia citizens come up with solutions uh, to make sure that their child was adequately supervised while the parents continued and, and, and could and chose to continue to work. So this was, a, this was basically a private way of our Georgia citizens to come up with a solution that allowed their, their children to, to again learn in a forced sort of environment of uh, tele-learning, if you will, and be adequately supervised. Chairman Knight, you're exactly right. And the power of the individual is a beautiful thing when, um, when put under pressure and having to, to adapt to a situation. And, uh, and a, and a parent who's, uh, who's going to fight for their child to make sure that they're adequately learning is, is, is a wonderful thing to watch. Representative Higley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just had a question. Uh, in terms of the number of children that can be in a pod, is that specified anywhere? Ma'am, I'm sorry, I didn't. I heard the number of children. The the number of children that can be in a pod, is that specified anywhere? Not in this language, no. Thanks. Now, when you get into D 
decals, um, family, child care, home daycare thing, it, they get into the numbers there, but not in a learning pod. Chair Lady Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize because I haven't looked at this bill thoroughly. Is this just while the emergency is on and the school is on virtual learning? Uh, what happens about going back to school if the school goes back to in-person? Right, so a, a great example. If we tied it to the pub, state of public emergency, um, one issue you would run into is if you remember last Friday, uh, schools across the state shut down or, or delayed start because of the storms. And um, this is just, a, it allows parents to get, make a quick decision um, or, or really make quick adjustments um, in a case like that. Because so, like for my children, I was notified at you know, 4 p.m. the day before uh, that they were gonna start school a little bit later. Now, some schools didn't go in at all and they did all virtual on that day. And so if you're a working parent, you've gotta make a quick, you know, quick adjustment. So that would be my fear of tying it to a state of public health emergency. Um, is that in, in a case of a storm or, or whatever other disaster that may happen um, that, that, that could hurt it in that situation. So you're like the hurricanes that went through South Georgia. Exactly. Same kind of situation. Yes, Chair Lady Cooper, one more question. But if the schools, and it's not a, one of those kinds of situation, and the schools have gone back in to in person in the schools, do the children go back into? Yes, the, correct. Oh, that's all. Correct. That's, Okay. Well, thank you, sir. I don't see any more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Or, Ms. Lewis, are there any other senators out there? Okay. There's no other senator out there? Is there a Senator Paul Smith out there? Okay, let him come in. Morning, Mor sir. Morning, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. Well, you're not... You're not a senator. I am not, thank the good Lord in heaven above. Well, that was the message that we got that a senator was out there. I, I, you know, I don't want to downgrade myself, Mr. Chairman. I'm proud of well, We don't want to ground downgrade you either. <laughs> you deserve better. Uh, thank um, you, Mr. Chairman. So you're going to do Senator Jones's Senate Bill 78, correct? Yes, you're sir. You're carrying it on the House floor? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I bring before you Senate Bill 78. Uh, this is uh, a bill that you've probably heard about. It's uh, concerning uh, revenge porn. Uh, this is basically a bill to address a situation where uh, an individual uploads a video of someone else to a pornographic website without their consent. And uh, if you'll look within the bill, the penalty um, under this legislation, for the first time uh, that someone would do this, this would be um, sentenced or charged as a misdemeanor of a high and aggravated nature. And upon a second or subsequent violation of this code section, uh, it would then be a felony. What's the sentence on the first one? The sentence one of a misdemeanor of a high and aggravated nature, basically it's a misdemeanor except instead of a $1,000 maximum fine, you go up to a $5,000 maximum fine is my understanding. Any jail time? Uh, it could be jail time, could be up to 12 months. Okay. So, and th th this is a, a problem that we have seen uh, occur for years and years now just with the uh, advent of the internet becoming more and more
uh, accessible to our population. So uh, th this is really putting teeth in our code section to actually make this a, a more deterrent uh, law. Okay. Chairman Martin. I don't know why. Gentlemen, you'll for a question. I don't know why I feel like I need to ask this, but no, I sir. do. This is someone that does this purposely, correct? I mean, I just want to make that clear. There's so many, I mean, again, I'm not into uh, making these types of photographs. Um, or, 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 I mean, I just don't want to go down that road. Um, I'm going to cut you off there. So, yeah. no, I, but, but, but I do want to make clear that folks that yeah. might do that, their, their phones are backed up and, and things that get out of there. So I just want to make sure we don't inadvertently catch somebody and, and send them to jail for 12 months or $5,000 for something inadvertent. That's taken care of in the language. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Th this, you would have to intentionally do that. No, that's all I wanted to do. It was an intentional act. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Representative Hughley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm almost afraid to ask the question, but um, my concern is for children, our teenagers. Are, are we, do we have protections in place where we're not going to inadvertently catch teenagers who may be technically guilty of this um, you know while you're in high school you you know sure well I, I, and I appreciate the question and what I, what I would say is uh, we already have the law that we're someone that is uh, of certain age and acts in a manner as an adult would they are no longer acting as what we would consider a child to act uh, if they're acting in that manner as an adult would, then yes, you could very well have someone that was a teenager that did this that could be prosecuted under this law. Now, I, I can't speak for prosecutorial discretion. We still give a lot of discretion to our prosecutors as to how they draw this up and whether they'd want to send this uh, down to juvenile court or not. So uh, it wouldn't take away that discretion, but uh, there could be a hypothetical situation where they could be charged under this law. Chairman Setzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To, to the, the lady's question, Representative Hooley, great question. We talked about that in committee. I would just highlight on behalf of the gentleman that what we've created here is, is high school students that are sharing this, these pictures with other high school kids, that's still a misdemeanor. What we've created here, though, and what Senator Jones, I think, is very carefully done is on uh, lines 20 through 24 and 30 through 34, is if you post it, however, not to people, but to a website, peer-to-peer -peer sharing file, and you know, these movie galleries that have hundreds of millions of, of viewers around the world looking at these things, that's where it gives rise to a, to a felony. So kids sharing stuff, people doing an ugly revenge porn circumstance, still misdemeanor post it for global viewing, that becomes a felony. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, All Mr. right, no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the I don't, I don't remember what color badge the senators are wearing now, but I don't want to, see, want to ever see you in one, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'll do my best not to. Okay, that's a real step down. Okay. Well, that's all the senators and House members that we have to, uh, who want to present their bill. I think we have a motion from uh, Whip Kelly as it relates to Senate Bill 82. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask that Senate Bill 82 be recommitted, but be committed to the Special Committee on Access to the Civil Justice System. Got a motion. I hear a second. I got a second. All in favor say aye. All opposed, like sign. It's gone back to Special Committee on Access to Civil Justice System. All right, um, I have a motion now from um, J Secretary Jaspers on Senate Bill 6. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion to recommit Senate Bill 6 back to the Ways and Means Committee. Got a motion and a, I hear a second. Six. Got a second. All in favor say aye. All opposed like sign. Is back in Ways and Means. So Senate Bill 6 has been sent back to Ways and Means, and Senate Bill 82 has been recommitted to the Special Committee on Access to Civil Justice System. All right. 
Now, if y'all remember yesterday, it was voted on that we would limit uh, debate on any of these bills uh, to one hour at the discretion of the speaker. Um, we're going to set the supplemental calendar for tomorrow. This is the supplemental calendar. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that, I forgot to. Chairman Stevens, you, you got a couple of bills here. It's um, Senate Bill 142 or, or House Resolution, or Senate Resolution 135. Which one you gonna do first? I'll just talk about the Senate resolution because the House bill is just enabling legislation. So I'll go to SR 135. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, this bill came out overwhelmingly out of the Senate, and it is one that allows the Georgia citizens to vote if they want to allow for sports betting as a legal game within the lottery. It makes, um, uh, it, it disallows anyone 21 years of age or less from participating. It does not allow credit or credit cards to be set up. It disperses the revenue from this between 100 to 150 million but, um, at 40 and one half percent to hope to 12 and one half percent on an opportunity fund needs base, 12 and a half percent to rural health, if you will. We've had a hospital close this few months ago in uh, rural Georgia. 12 and a half percent to mental health, 12 percent to rural broadband. If you might remember, we passed a bill at crossover day to try to help broadband and we've gone a whole year with kids that can't learn because there's no internet. And 3% to promote a revenue generating sports perpetual fund for major sporting events. Mr. Chairman, it also in the bill uh, right sizes our um, uh, lottery shortfall fund or our lottery reserve to the current 50% reserve, but it also places a ceiling at six, 60% and it does it over a period of years. Mr. Chairman, that's what the bill does, but it allows the voters of the state of Georgia to make this decision for another game. Okay, Senate uh, Speaker Pro Tem. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what is your estimate on what that 3% would generate? Say that again. The 3% for the commission. Um, the 3% would be 3% of 100 million, so what's that, 30? Three, 3 million. So, is this to bring in something like World Cup or something yes. like that? The, I mean, it, my concern is that $3 million a year seems like a lot of money to set up a structure when, just like we did with the Super Bowl, I mean, if there really is a, um opportunity for a major, you know, Super Bowl or uh, sports, or not, the um, World Cup, I mean, the legislature would at that time, what we've done in the past is evaluate if we need to do a tax break. And so it seems like three million a year to set up what could become a jobs program that um, they could set up this commission for a lot less, uh, you know, maybe 1% and put the other 2% towards other needs. I'll I'm accept that as an amendment, 1%. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Chair, Lady Cooper. This is on sports betting. On yes. Okay. Does this include betting on our colleges? No. Okay. So they are out of it totally because I know that there was real concern with Georgia Tech and the University of Georgia. In the original bill um, that we took up yesterday, it was voted to take sports betting out. So that is not included in the okay. current version. Okay. And it's only sports betting, no horse betting or casinos that were. No, no. That no, no. Not. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Chairman Smyre. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, this is something that I, I, I favor and I have worked on this for maybe two years and I've talked with you quite a bit about it, but in, in, in section on, on, um, on line 89 on page four, um, I'm sorry, on line um, 93, tell me, the, the 40, is that 40 and a half percent going to the educational programs, that, that means that will go to the regular HOPE fund, is that, is that correct? That's correct, it that, goes to traditional HOPE and, and pre-K. 
and, and, and Hope right now has about a billion, over a billion in reserve, right? Uh, 1.2 billion, 1. yes. 1.2 billion. And then the one that I, we have advocated very, very strongly for and is very known has been the need-based scholarship because that's categorically aimed at um, those that need it most. In fact, when we first started Hope back in, we talked about it back in the 90s, it started off as need-based. And uh, it has evolved. And, and that's my major concern is, is that uh, that, that number, uh, putting 40% into a fund that has a billion dollars in it in reserve, and then adding the least amount to, to a category that is needed more than, and I mean, the study says it. In fact, when I talk to a lot of the university presidents, they tell me that their stopgap funds that they use for students that some can't even finish school because they owe $750 and $1,000. And, and, and we lose a lot of students and a lot of our uh, young people through the crack. In fact, I, um, I visited Georgia Tech one time and talked with their president when Wayne Clough was there. And they started a need-based stopgap fund. And uh, they had a $50 million fundraiser and they stopped at 85 million, just, just, just because that's how, that's how important it was that, that, that students, you know, so that, that is a, a, a serious situation with me. I, I just have to put that on the table. That, because I chaired the board at Fort Valley State University Foundation, and we started one recently, and, and I'm telling you, there is so much need. There is so much need with these students that, that can't pay $750, dollars $1,100, and they leave school because they can't, they can't afford it. And uh, to me, uh, we're trying to protect that intellectual capital, the human capital in our state, and I, I advocate that strongly. And so, and, and, and I, my last comment, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry for going so long. I agree with the speaker pro tem, I, I certainly support the marketing aspect of which I think is good. And, but, but you agreed to her that it was go from three to one. And I was, I was hoping that there was some sort of way that we could have some dialogue. I, I came to the, your committee yesterday and watched the debate. And uh, you and uh, Whip did a, a good job of explaining it. But that really kept me up last night. I really, that's how strong I feel about this issue. It is it's a major major issue and that 20 and a half 20 plus half and a half percent and if we could get that some kind of way up then I, I'm, I'm, I'm fully supportive of this measure and I want to tell you I appreciate working with you over these last two or three years on this subject matter you've been very straightforward you've been very transparent and I appreciate that and we've had a great relationship so Mr. Chairman uh, that's that's the only thing that I'd like to to see that we could take a look at, and, and, um, and I've explained this to the whip as well uh, earlier this morning, and uh, that 20 and a half percent for need-based scholarships, I don't oppose the other parts that are in there categorically, but that number, I can't see putting 40 percent, it's just like my checking account, if I had extra money, I don't think I'd put 40% in where I got a billion already in there, and then I would put 20% in there when I'm almost in overdraft. That's, that's my point. If you, if you were at your household, you wouldn't, if you had new money coming in, you wouldn't take 40% where you got a billion in your savings account and put 20% in when you got operational and it's a deficit, it's overdrawn. So that's the best. Okay, thank, thank you, you, sir. Whip Kelly. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to, because as we are talking about funds that, that are going to be avail available for some great purposes in Georgia, including expanding access to uh, the university system for the first time in a needs-based way, 
uh, Mr. Chairman, isn't it true that by eliminating colleges that we're going to miss out on around $70 million worth of revenue and a large part of that, in fact, 60 percent would be directly beneficial to the universities who fought this on? And if they're concerned, uh, the concern we heard in committee uh, dealt with uh, the fact that uh, that the athletes uh, aren't being paid, that maybe we need to have an even more robust discussion this legislature making sure that college athletes get uh, not taken advantage of by some of these universities. Maybe that question doesn't have to be answered, but that's, uh, I'm frustrated that $70 million could have been gone to good use here in our universities who constantly come to us with their hand out, uh, wanted to take that out of the, uh, the ability for children to go to school. Mr. Williamson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Stevens, uh, where are you? Uh, I'm sorry, hey, uh, Chairman Stevens. My question gets back to the, in your opening remarks, you were talking about how these uh, funds would be spent in order to uh, wager. Did you say no credit cards would be used? That's true. There is no credit cards allowed. We went back to our position and that no credit cards or no credit can be extended by those vendors that that our contract with the lottery yes I, i'm just showing my ignorance how in the world would uh, uh debit a card be placed it would be debit card or a transfer so there would be no so credit it's, oh so it is electronic it's just limited to debit cards yes and further question if you don't mind um how do we protect our youth from accessing uh, these sports very uh, good question and, and and in the bill itself no one under 21 years whenever you sign up for an account through one of these vendors you're not allowed to to place a bet if you're under 21 years of age but how do they know they, they saw everything's online it's verified by the time that you set up your account then uh, the, the same way the lottery i suppose does it. final question i'm just i have to assume that uh if we if the state of georgia uh, gets into the expands the gambling business to include electronic betting on sports. Um, I'm assuming that there will be TV ads saying, "Come bet on your favorite team, bet on the next touchdown." Uh, that'll be inundating the airwaves that will uh, uh, entice our children, our youth, into that um, habit of gambling. Isn't that true? No, with all due respect, you cannot gamble under 21 years of age, and there's severe penalties if you're caught doing that. And the truth is, it's well, you just can't do it. It's a um, there's a major penalty if, if somebody's allowed either to gamble uh, under 21 years of age or if you. Um, what was the other point that I was going to make? Or if they extend credit in any way. Those those two issues are pretty pretty solid. And, and keep in mind, um, Mr. Chairman, this is going on today. All that we want to do is make it legal and make sure that we have the safeguards placed in there that the lottery has a two and a half decade history of doing to make sure that this is done in an appropriate way. Well, I'm final comment. My, the, the way that it's been done, and I voted against it in 1992 or four, mm -hmm. and I do, Calvin, um, uh, Dean Smyre's exactly correct it was needs based at that time I remember that discussion vividly but the and, and it has done the things that the, this legislature and uh, state government promised that it would do uh, to the benefit of tens of thousands of students in Georgia but the way that it's being conducted now the marketing of it um, it, it is rather limited I still argue that it was a regressive tax and continues to be a regressive tax but when we start doing the TV ads, taking the number one entertainment uh, uh, venues, football, soccer, basketball, that are all of our young adults, let me get to over 21 and older, young adults are, are this part of their passion and their pastime and put TV ads on it, um, all for a relatively little amount of income coming back to the state of Georgia, $100 million. I just think, is it not true that, um, that will have social consequences because of this the next step in gambling. Uh, I, with all due respect, I don't think so. We've got um, 1.9 million Georgians that have gotten today um, the Hope Scholarship. 1.6 million families have gotten pre-K. This money is going to go right back into supporting those folks that have received it and, more importantly, those families that are looking for their 
children and children's children, as mine do, to benefit from this. This is just another lottery game. Okay, um, the, you know, the school board's lit up up here, uh, and I think most of this will be done during uh, debate on the House floor, so I'm going to stop all the d discussion on this and turn off all the blinking lights. Yeah. Hmm. So, do you have, uh, oh, do you have, um, what's the other number? 142, are you going to? Mr. Chairman, all this does is it's just the enabling legislation for the Senate resolution, and it's all the details. Okay. Any questions from anyone? Wilkerson? Uh, who's? Oh, okay. I left you on. Thanks, sir. All right. Chairman Smyre. Mr. Chairman, uh, from, a, from a process standpoint, um, with the chair, uh, is there a process where now uh, it could be amended? Uh, what what's the wish of the chair? Is it is it is, are we in that posture now? Or no, sir. Just take okay. Who's back there in the back? Just got Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and 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 thank you, Chairman Stevens. It's been a long road, but. Uh, my concern, I just wanted to state on the, you know, there's two pieces here, the CA and then the enabling legislation. I, I'm just curious as to the clear definition of need base was much better than the other bill because it was clearly stated on medium income. Everybody under medium income. That was specific. I think it was imported in the bill. The bill that came out of the Senate, 41 to 10, had 50% in that particular fund. What happened to 30% of the money when it got over here? Mr. Chairman, we'd left this vague, if you will, as we just took the Senate language. And some of the stuff that we did as far as need-based, I might um, go back to uh, Whip Kelly to, for the specific language on that, but it just makes it vague in there. Okay. All right. Uh, no more questions. Thank you, sir. I understand Senator Payne is outside. He has Senate Bill 220. Morris Under. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Sorry for my absence. I was chairing the Education Committee. Oh, that don't matter. That it started at the same time. Go ahead. Yes, um, Chairman of the Committee, I'm bringing you Senate Bill 220. This is the Georgia Civics Renewal Act. It's simply to establish the Commission, uh, the Georgia Commission on Civics Education. It's now comprised of 17 members will be appointed from the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judici judiciary, judicial branch of our government, including pro public and private partnerships is serving on this committee, just to make sure and establish that we're teaching proper civics education in our state. Okay. Whip Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, I certainly appreciate the conversation around civics. Uh, I know in your committee right now, the House has sent over a piece of legislation that talks about uh, helping students get uh, uh, taught financial literacy as well. Could you tell us the status on that bill in your committee? In which committee? In your committee, the Education Committee. That that bill is that bill is, is we just passed out with substitute. What did the substitute do? The, the substitute is the Dexter Mosley. Is the what? The Dexter Mosley language. See, so I took out financial literacy. That's what the, that was what the committee decided to do. Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. No more questions. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're going to set the, cal the supplemental calendar for tomorrow. And if you'll remember, I, th I think I said earlier that uh, Chairman Hatchett 
when I had passed 33.3 to the limit debate to one hour, that it would be distributed at the direction of the speaker. And we don't want to hear what he's got to say over there, do we? Okay. All right. This is a supplemental calendar for tomorrow. H.R. 406. Now hear a move. Got a move and a second. All in favor say aye. All opposed, like sign. It's on. SB 46. Now hear a move. Got a move and a second. All in favor say aye. All opposed, like sign. It's on. Senate Bill 47. Do I hear a move? move. Got a move and a second. All in favor say aye. All opposed, like sign. Okay, raise your hand. Those opposed, one, two. It, it's on. Senate Bill 213, and these are all, this is under modified structure as was 46 and 47. 213, do I hear a move? move. Got a move and a second, all in favor say aye. All opposed like sign. Senate Bill 246, do I hear a move? move. Got a move and a second, all in favor say aye. All opposed like sign. The next two are on the yellow sheet. Senate Bill 142, do I hear a move? Got a move and a second, all in favor say aye. All opposed, like sign. It's on. SR 135, do I hear a move? Got a move and a second, all in favor say aye. All opposed, like sign. It's on. Who said, I'm, uh, all knows, raise your hand. You count me. Trust me. Yeah, I trust you. It's on. So let me read it one more time. The modified open 406, uh, that'll be carried by Mr. LaHood. Under modified structure 46, it'll be carried by Chairman Cooper. Uh, Senate Bill 47 be carried by Mr. Wade, Senate Bill 213, it'll be carried by Mr. Rhodes, Senate Bill 246, it'll be carried by Chairman Jaspers, and I guess 142 and 135 will be carried by Chairman Stevens. That's it. We'll have a, we'll have a meeting tomorrow morning to, uh, at 9 o'clock to set Monday's calendar. But don't forget, this is the supplemental calendar, the first supplemental calendar for tomorrow. Meeting's adjourned. <laughs>